I'm really excited now to show an actual application of hyperserts. And we have a very interesting first use case to show you um, using another set of protocols called Gitcoin. So I'm just going to share my screen now and we can talk through, yeah, so uh, here we go. Um, great, so you, you heard from Ray about blockchain basics and he demonstrated the hyperserts smart contracts. And now I'm going to talk in, about a specific use case where we have combined hyperserts um, with another set of protocols run by an organization called Gitcoin. Um, so Gitcoin is a DAO, and DAO stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization, which manages a set of Ethereum protocols for funding public goods using something called quadratic funding. Um, and since 2019, they've given out more than $70 million to public goods using quadratic funding. Uh, so first, I'll just tell you a little bit about this funding mechanism. Um, what is quadratic funding? Um, it is basically a way of allocating funding across a community um, by taking the square root of what everybody is contributing. And so in a normal system, one vote might be counted as having a weight of one, but in a quadratic system, you basically take the, um, the, the square root of that. And so if you want to assert 20 votes in, in the favor of a public good that you support, you would need to spend 400 tokens in order to do that. If you want to um, support, uh, if you want to put four votes towards something, then so if you want to put four tokens towards something, then that would require two votes. So basically what this does is it dampens the effect of some of the um, larger, wealthier members of the community and tries to shift more power and decision-making um, to the edges, to things that are popular within the community. And I can give you a quick example of what that looks like. Um, so here you can see a, a, a funder who has allocated $1,000 um, towards funding three different projects. And so what you can see down here is a simulation of individual donors contributions towards each of those grants. And so the first one here, a person put in, there's only one supporter and that person was a, was a, a wealthy supporter, they put in $100. Um, in grant two, there were four supporters that each put in $10. And in grant three, there were 13 supporters that each put in $1. And so you can see how the matching formula works. Um, so even though grant one received the most from donors, it received the smallest match funding because it was the least popular of the three grants. And by comparison, grant number three, even though each donor only gave $1 a piece and received a total of $13, it received a larger, the largest share of, of the matching pool. So again, this is a pretty interesting way of getting people to decide what is the best way of funding um, different needs within a community. And so Gitcoin has been doing this since 2019, um, and they have created a set of smart contracts that allow you to run quadratic funding on the blockchain. So basically anyone who has a set of issues that they want to fund, they can join the platform as a round manager, and through that, they can attract projects, and based on the popular support, of members of the community, they can determine how that funding is allocated across those projects. So that's kind of how, how Gitcoin works at a high level. Now we're going to actually share some results um, from their most recent funding mm -hmm. round, which raised. So what you can see here, this is a, a snapshot, um, but they put up a match for software projects. And in total, they received from members of the community. Um, and that came from a total of about 26,000 unique donors. And so you can see over here, each of the projects that were included in this round, the total amount of donations they received and the number of unique donors. So this one here at the very top, Leinster, that was the most popular project and that it got over 16,000 unique donors um, and received a, a pretty large amount of funding. So one of the things which is, um, great about blockchains is that they many of them many of the um the, the protocols choose to expose a, a subgraph which allows you to see information um uh, that is being recorded on chain and in this case in the case of gitcoin we're actually able to look up info about each project so i can actually just um, share this tab over here um, so what you're able to do is uh create a graphql query and from that, it will turn information about every one of the projects that were included in the round. 
Um, and so this represents a unique ID for the project. And over here, you have a pointer um, to a uh, IPFS um, content ID that allows you to gain information about that project. And so I'm going to, yeah, if, if you look at that, that pointer field here at the bottom, um, this allows us to look up information about that project. Um, so I'm going to show you an example here of the data that came from Leinster, which was the top project that was funded on Gitcoin grants. Um, so you can see here that if you go to the, if you take the, the content ID and you look that up on IPFS, um, what you're able to see is a data file that includes important info about the project, like its description, social handles, and most importantly, um, it includes an Ethereum address. Um, and this is the address where any donor who wants to support that project, they will be sending um, a small amount of cryptocurrency to. So you can see this, um, this, this field right here, that contains the address where the funding will come to. And so we can actually go to a block explorer with this address, we can identify every single um, individual who made a donation to that project. This is one of the really, really cool things about blockchains and the ability to access open data about all of the transactions that have happened involving that address. Um, so I can share this here. Um, I have taken the, the address and you can see every one of these transactions involving Gitcoin. All of these are recorded on chain. And you can even come in and look up and see um, you know, the details of the transaction. Um, you can look at um, more information about the different uh, events that were, were, were triggered um, through their interaction with the smart contract. All of this data is available um, and accessible on chain. So we took this data about all of the donations that went to those projects, um, and we use that to create a hypercert for each Gitcoin project. Um, so Holka's going to tell you a bit more about the uh, the roadmap for hypercert, but hopefully from last week's session with Noah, you got a bit of an introduction for how hypercerts work um, and what goes into them. Uh, so what what we've done is taken the data about each Gitcoin project and converted that into the fields that are required to create a hypercert. Um, and I can share this again. Um, so you have the name, you have an image that is appearing over here. You have a banner background, which makes the artwork, artwork look nice. There's a description, a link, and all of this was pulled from their, um, their grant application to Gitcoin. Um, then we have the work scope, which in this case is the same as the name of the project. Um, the dates of the work happened, um, the primary contributor, this is that person's Ethereum um, naming service, which resolves back to their um, Ethereum address. There are some advanced fields which have been hidden um, for the sake of keeping it simple for first time users. Um, and then the last thing that is included here is a list of all of the um, the project would have all this information for them based on their Gitcoin grant. Confirm these boxes and they would try to create the hypercert. Now I'm not going to be able to do it now because my wallet is not connected, but this is just an example of how that would work. Um, and so the other thing that I can show here is the, the metadata. So basically this is a visual representation of the hypercert metadata. Um, and I can share this over here. A lot of image data on, on the top. fraction of the hypercert. And so right now, if you contribute $1, mm -hmm. that allows you to claim, I'll I think in my case, I contributed $16 to this project. And so I was able to claim um, 16 units um, in, in my fraction. And so this displays not only what I own, but also gives a leaderboard of a, in the share of the project that they contributed to. 
Um, and in the most recent Gitcoin round, there are more than 150 projects that participated. Um, so it's actually a very rich data set of the preferences that people have and the projects that they want to support in their community. Um, the other thing which is, which is cool is that once the hypercert has been created, um, it will automatically be indexed by third-party marketplaces like OpenSea. Um, so OpenSea is one of the most popular trading platforms for NFT. And just because we have interacted um, with, a, with a token standard that is supported by OpenSea, you can come in and you can see, you can see um, this hypercert showing up on OpenSea. And in the same way that we were able to look at the metadata, you can grab it over here and um, you know, view the hypercert properties. This is really cool. Um, one of the, the great things about uh, the, the composability that is supported by um, smart contracts and, uh, and the Ethereum blockchain. So just to conclude, uh, a few reasons why we're excited about this first use case. Um, for projects, this makes it easy for them to see who some of their biggest funders are, um, who gave the most, um, what, what percent of the overall funding that represented. Um, they can also see funders' preferences as well as the other projects that they funded. Um, and this can actually be very useful because it will allow people looking at the round to identify impact themes. So maybe these are clusters of projects that lots of people tend to support. Um, and maybe there's something similar about those projects or they have a similar set of needs. In addition, you're also able to observe cooperation across social, social distance. So essentially being able to identify very different projects that seem to have support from different types of users. Um, so for instance, if I like a open source software project, and I also like two climate projects, that reveals something very interesting about my preferences. Um, and so this allows people that are looking at the round and the overall community to identify things that are popular, um, clusters that might ordinarily exist because they are similar projects or they have a very similar type of impact. Um, a, a real world example of this might be identifying people who like um, who like travel, and at the same time they like um, eating, uh, uh, drinking coffee, and they also like um, driving Toyotas. Um, so it's a way of identifying different things um, that people uh, share interest in across uh, across uh, a social graph. And then finally, um, another thing that we're quite excited about is that the same hypercert primitive. Um, that we just illustrated for Gitcoin can be used for other impact funding ecosystems. And so within the world of, of Web3, there are a number of different grants platforms which are all trying to fund things which are impactful for their communities. And what we're able to do is, is leverage um, all of these data sets to be able to surface um, which people are funding, um, different, uh, different types of public goods, and some of the similarities across social distance. Um, I think the last two slides from Carl were not uh, uh, seen directly. Um, what I will do now, um, basically, like our approach today, um, was like really starting from the basics, going over the code, um, then to the application. And um, I will now zoom out again and look forward um, what comes next for the Hypersets Protocol and the Hypersets Foundation. Um, so. The reason why we think about hypersets as su such a general concept as a primitive for funding mechanisms is that it is, it is able to be applicable to grants, to bounties, to retrospective funding, which are um, quite different types of uh, funding. If you just like um, pay somebody for the future work or um, pay for something that has been like achieved um, but was fairly clearly defined or retrospectively was evaluated as something impactful and was then um funded um afterwards and there can be many many um different decision mechanisms how we actually decide how to give out a grant um or how to apply retrospective i also uh, showed one of them the quadratic um, voting or quadratic funding um but there are very different ones um just to, like a simple decision a majority vote as uh, as process or a market mechanism like an auction um then there are different funding objects because uh, what we really want to um, um, fund is the impact, but sometimes it's difficult to really fund the impact. That's why sometimes you have to fund just like the outcomes are out. 
a lot of grants are actually just funding activities where we don't really know what the real impact is. So that's why we are really excited about the um, use case for hypersets for retrospect. Really kind of um, mean like recording the work from the past um, and bringing that into the future so that funding can be applied throughout kind of time um, towards the most impactful things. Um, and we will think of hypersearch as really as this data layer um, below all of these um, different types of funding mechanisms. And the um, hypersearch primitive is um, kind of agnostic um, about these different funding mechanisms can be applied to all of them. Um, but as I said, we are most excited currently about applying it to retrospective funding. Um, <clears throat> and that is also like a reason um, why we think as this primitive as something where we can build on top on um, in very modular way. So very different projects can um, explore different decision mechanisms, different funding mechanisms, and all use kind of the same primitive. And that is what um, we are looking to enable um, through the Hypersearch Foundation, that we have developed this, this primitive that we will extend and also um, iterate a little bit on um, to really make it the most useful for a lot of projects, um, but then enable kind of an ecosystem to build on top of that. So you should also take that as an invitation if you want to build on top of Hypersearch or use it um, in, um, in, a, in a project. Um, feel free to like also get in contact with us how um, that is um, possible in the, in the best way. Um, so what is really next is kind of the public release of the protocol. Um, then um, as Carl introduced kind of the, the, the pilot that we um, want to run and um, are like, about to run. Um, and then really using the feedback um, into like kind of what is the, the concrete next, next step on the roadmap. Um, but the big piece um, that is currently um, missing is kind of the open evaluation system because hypersets really get um, a lot of value out of um, reputable um, evaluations being submitted. Know what kind of valuable oh, wow. really created the, the, the most impact so that the funders can retrospectively, uh, retrospectively reward them. We think of an open evaluation yeah. system for that um, where anybody can permissionless submit yeah. evaluations and then um, over time we will learn which are really like the most um, credible evaluators um, to find out who um, oh, then yeah. has also like created the, oh. the most impact um, from the projects um, and um, over time we really have like a, a learning feedback loop about uh, what are the most impactful um, projects um, they also get the most impact um, like the most funding um, such a um, really talent and resources are then attracted by these um, most impactful projects. Um, when we have also like an open evaluation system, then it really is about testing um, this, this mechanism and this, this ecosystem in specific impact areas. So if that is, um, for example, AI safety, if that is biodiversity, if that is like general open source software, um, how do we really um, enable these um, impactful areas to use hypersearch and to, to fund the most um, impactful projects. Um, because I um, talked about one of the next steps is really the evaluation. Um, what we believe is one of the distinctive feature of hypersearch in contrast to other impact certificates is that we disentangle the, um, the description of the work from the evaluation. So to a hypersearch, many different evaluations can be submitted. Um, they even can um, say different things about the work and the impact so that we actually can use different methodologies to learn about what methodology is the best. And also over time, um, come to a different conclusion that something that we um, believe was really impactful might um, turn out in the future not as impactful. Um, but because we disentangled kind of the um, description of the work from really the evaluation, um, we can um, allow that over time um, to, to be really captured by this um, whole um, hypersets ecosystem. 
Um, and what we want to enable through this um, whole ecosystem is that really impact evaluation is recognized as one of the crucial aspects um, and that impact evaluators um, should also um, at least get like, like have some, some business model if they are professional um, evaluators, because if you imagine um, evaluating the biodiversity of uh, a forest, um, that can be very costly, but it's really important in order to know what is the best thing that we should do. Um, and if there is really like a business model for impact evalu evaluators, then we get high quality evaluation. Um, funders can make better decisions and um, projects with the highest impact really yeah. get rewarded. And this is then something that um, kind of um, enables this feedback loop of learning really um, what was the best um, and inspiring other projects to do this because that is exactly what gets the, the rewards in the end. Um, this is, um, as I mentioned, kind of also like the mission then of of open source protocols for funding and rewarding positive impact. We based um, on the, the research project from uh, Protocol Labs, um, and then um, have now the hyperspace where we um, bring this idea um, into uh, a reality that we want to shape with everybody who wants to contribute to this effort. Um, if you want to contribute to this effort, um, feel free to join our Telegram group um, or um, get more information on hypersets.org. Um, there will, um, that's where we also will publish all the information about like, the upcoming things. Um, and if you um, have a project that wants to use hypersets, if you want to build on top of hypersets, then also feel free to just write us uh, at team at hypersets.org. Um, and that is um, everything I have for now. Um, and uh, we'll be excited about any uh, questions um, or uh, any comments as well. I do have a lot of questions, but I think we have a question uh, in the chat, a couple of questions in the chat. So um, I think you guys can take a look and uh, see who's the best to answer them. Sure, so I can take the first question. I know Ray is actually reconnecting right now. Um, but the question from, from Ming Yi is about solidity. So there are a lot of smart contracts that can be inherited to our project. Um, but for the beginning, what's the opinion about whether we should write one by ourselves for practice or just know what the functions do and inherit it? Um, Ray, you're on now. Do you want to take that one? Yeah. yeah. One of the things that's really cool about the crypto space in general is just how much open source code there is. Um, and, one of, and the second thing is just because these are smart contracts that are intermediating financial value, um, security vulnerabilities are... Uh, a huge deal, right? Like you, we're already worried about security vulnerabilities in the typical software. Um, if there is a security vulnerability in a smart contract, you know, it's not crazy for it to mean that an attacker could siphon millions of dollars. Um, so security is incredibly important. Um, so for both of those reasons, I would argue more often than not, if you can find some existing open source code that does what you want it to do, that has gone through a security audit or some form of security analysis, um, it's usually better to leverage existing, existing libraries. Um, there are a number of existing libraries for, say, for example, tokens contracts um, that you can leverage. Uh, Open Zeppelin contracts are a good example. Um, I can link to that in a second, but um, these are you know, thoroughly audited. Plenty of people use these and it's all free. So there's re no reason not to use it. Um, I would say, you know, for at least me personally, I would really only consider writing new contracts if I believe that, you know, I can't already find something that fits my use case. Uh, in the case of hypercerts, because we're building so many things that are very new and different, um, this impact funding ecosystem is not something that um, already exists. You know, I just, <laughs> uh, I have to build something uh, to, to satisfy with that. But even still, you know, again, I, I take security extremely seriously. And if there is um, uh, something I'm going to deploy on mainnet, um, I will make sure that, you know, I've gone through it many times. I've written all sorts of different test cases to test different edge cases and um, different types of, you know, um, security considerations, security analyses. And we will more often than not hire at least one, if not multiple. Um, security auditors to look over our code and make sure that we haven't missed anything. Because again, you know, it, whenever you're dealing with code that 
uh, moves money, you want to make sure you you don't mess up. There's also some really great free resources for learning Solidity. I shared one, but there's a number of other both YouTube tutorials as well as um, sites that give you a, a pretty well curated set of uh, practices and ways of getting getting familiar with, with writing around smart contracts. Yeah, great. Um, the second question around uh, tracking offline progress of the projects. I'm happy to start that one and hopefully if I miss anything, feel free to, to jump in. Um, so this is certainly a really big issue. Um, we, we call it impact evaluation. So basically identifying once a project is, is underway or project has completed, how can you get a really robust assessment of what type of impact happened from that project? Um, and so I think it will depend a lot on the type of project it is to determine what's the best way of, of tracking impact. But I think a, view, a vision for the future that, that we're excited about is one where you have a open impact evaluation system, which allows people to use different approaches. It could be sensors. It could be ways of, say, scanning an open source software repo, identifying um, forks or dependencies on top of it, um, to doing interviews with stakeholders and beneficiaries who might be um, impacted by the project, um, even to a user submitting their own review on how the product helped or hurt them. Um, ultimately, what we'd like to see is a number of technical and non-technical participants that are able to evaluate projects, and all of that provides feedback and signal to funders about what projects are most impactful. Um, but I definitely see a role for, for things like sensors um, to, to help with this, especially when it comes to uh, projects that are having a real world impact. Um, so I think the, um, the the role of the impact evaluator is exactly um, how Carl described. And then um, I think in the, the question, was, there was like a second aspect to the question of like, how can um, then, like if you can give a, a specific example, it's happy to do that. Um, and then um, how the funders can in the end also receive um, some distribution. And um, I assume that that is related also to the idea that um, if there's retrospective rewards in the future, um, then projects who need initial um, capital to, to actually um, do their project and create the impact, um, how then also the funders who funded this um, impact in the first place, how they can get, get rewarded. Um, so, and uh, I think that there are many different examples, um, if that is um, AI safety research or <coughs> biodiversity. Um, if, uh, in, in, on the slide earlier, there was an example of like um, planting trees and um, having positive impact on biodiversity, but also on, on um, like carbon um, in, in the atmosphere or like less carbon in the atmosphere. Um, so that is, those are examples. And we believe that hypersearch is such a general uh, primitive that it's actually applicable to, to all of these. Um, but retrospective funding is probably more applicable to some areas um, than others. And um, one of the biggest um, criteria where like um, retrospective funding um, like is, is better in one area than another is how much uncertainty is resolved um, in the future. So if I don't know if a project will be successful in the future or not, um, then um, there's a huge difference if I fund it today or in the future. Um, because in the future, I know much more about like, the impact and can appropriately um, value this impact. Um, but if um, I, I couldn't do that in the beginning. So in the beginning, I basically just, um, if I believe that there might be impact, there might be an expectation of positive impact, then I just um, kind of want to fund that it actually happens. But in the, in the future, really, I can reward um, those who took the risk that um, the project might actually not have that impact for um, funding the, the project in the first place. There are different ways of how we actually can think about the value flows um, because if the hypersert is just um, the kind of thing that the retrospective funder um, kind of buys from the uh, from the project, then the project receives um, kind of the the retrospective rewards, and then can pass that on to anybody who like initially funded the project. So um, this is kind of as as if um, somebody would produce a good that is um, then valued and sold on the classic um, for profit market. Um, this could be the 
project um, kind of sells the hyperset as the impact um, to a retrospective funder, and then um, the the project could have used any kind of like um, investment vehicle um, that is not the hyperset in this case um, to really also pass on the the funds. Uh, back to whoever made this project happen in the first place. Um, so that is kind of one way to do it, um, but there are also other uh, ways how the funding flows um, can work. Um, and we are exploring currently what is the best way um, to do this. Um, I think, Ray, maybe the second question is, for, or the next question is for you. Oh, um, the, the one about the benefit of decentralized apps. Um, um, yeah, it's a, it's a fair point. I mean, I think um, you're going to have to look at your risk profile. Um, let's say, for example, non-financial applications where uh, the side effects are uh, less severe. Um, you know, obviously there are a number of different cloud applications that satisfy people's use cases today. And uh, you'll have to decide uh, based on the jurisdiction of where your cloud application runs. Uh, and the laws that govern that particular cloud application, uh, whether that's satisfactory um, in terms of protecting users sufficiently. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think there's a good argument to be made that you'll have to think about that from a case by case basis. I think there are a lot, um, a lot of examples of trusting a, a big company uh, in, uh, going wrong. Um, you know, not just due to geopolitical tensions, um, but uh, just due to the temptations of um, ethical behavior. Like for the vast majority, many, many different types of cloud applications are not actually very regulated in terms of data collection, in terms of financial controls, in terms of information controls. For the most part, um, and you know, if you guys have done software internship, uh, at any big tech company, you know, you'll probably get that sense too. Um, yes, there are some controls that try to protect user data, but, uh, you know, if you have sufficient privileges, you have a lot of power and, uh, sometimes that power is abused more often than you would think. Um, you know, FTX was, uh, I don't know if you guys followed that, but that was, that was heartbreaking for a lot of us in the industry. You know, this was, uh, a fellow MIT grad. This was someone that had a lot of social capital. This was someone that was very famous. He was on all the different magazine covers, uh, you know, whether it was Forbes or Times or whatever. Like uh, people spoke about that co company glowingly. He had um, advertisements on TV. He was endorsed by, you know, Tom Brady and all sorts of different famous actors. Um, and he stole a lot, I mean, allegedly, uh, misused and misappropriated billions of dollars. Um, so that's a great example where, you know, um, yeah, it was probably one of the most trusted uh, cryptocurrency exchanges in the world um, up until, you know, October or November when we realized uh, just what was happening behind the scenes. So that's what happens when you have an opaque cloud system that you don't have the ability to inspect any of their code. You have no ability to see what they're actually doing. And uh, especially if you're in a space that's not regulated where you can't trust that the government is also looking in and making sure that they're not doing anything nefarious. How do you know? Um, I think reputations, um, reputations can hide more negative behavior than you would think. But I don't want to sound old and jaded and cynical. I've just seen too many people have their money stolen to truly believe that reputations are enough. Um, well, we have uh, some students, they will have a term project uh, about uh, using or thinking about how dApps, uh, the design or mechan mechanism could help on social good. And uh, I believe uh, hypersearch will be like one of the uh, great solution or the way they can uh, 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 to meet the goals. So, so uh, if any students would like to involve or like use the SDK or do some development upon HyperSource, how could they uh, keep connect with the team through the forum or Discord? 
And also, will there be any small grant for or motivation for students to do project based on hypersource? Yeah, I just ask for them. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, I already uh, posted uh, kind of the email address where you can reach out to us. Uh, this is one uh, that actually uh, all three of us will receive, like the team at hypersets.org, and then um, whoever is like the best uh, fit to answer questions um, can can uh, will take uh, the the incoming questions um, at the email. Uh, but also at the in the Telegram group, um, we have like general discussions. There are over 300 people um, in this uh, group where uh, general discussions around hypersearch um, happen. Um, but also through there, you can connect um, directly with us as well um, through through Telegram. Um, and uh, then regarding the the grants, um, we do have um, a micro grants. Um, um, program at protocol labs um, so basically um, if somebody has like a uh, an idea um, feel free also to like send it um, to us at team at hypersets.org um, we will um, then also discuss it and like advocate for it um, with uh, protocol labs i cannot uh, uh, here promise anything that uh, like we actually have the funding, um, but we are definitely um, very excited about anybody who wants to build on top of hypersearch and uh, we would advocate um, for for that as well um, and then and hope that um, we can make those projects uh, happen. Okay, thank you. Now, I do encourage everyone in this room to to play around with the uh, 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 on the website hypersearch.xyz to to make sure that you understand the, the, the details of how the impact uh, NFT or impact uh, 1155 um, is created and how impact is calculated in that sense. Um, Hypersis is still very, very new, very early. And it's one of the, the more advanced uh, public goods experiment in the world, right? So, so if any students wants to help, any student wants to contribute, it, it is a very good time to to jump in and and start working on 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 uh, in relevant fields or on hypersets itself. So, and uh, thank you for having us. And we are excited about hearing from you guys. Um, and anybody who wants to use or build on top of it um, has comments or questions. Um, and um, then we uh, look forward to collaborating and um, cooperating in the future.